Welcome back to another episode of Eco Engineering, where we look at urban technology and ideas that build a better world. Oh, yeah! I'm your engineer, Frittata, and this is Rocket Pan. Helper Extraordinaire. Today, we're going to check out a very important part of making big cities greener. Highways. Say no more. Entering coordinates. Away we go. Ooh. Ah, this is the opposite of a green highway. Oof. I was referring to pollinator highways for insects and animals. When cities expand, natural habitats are taken over by buildings, creating a lot of urban barriers for pollinators, like bees, bats, birds, butterflies, and uh, uh, other creatures that don't start with the letter B. <laughs> Even creatures that fly can have trouble getting from one flower patch to another in big cities, which is where pollinator highways come in. By planting shrubs and flowering plants in a path to connect different parks and flower-rich areas, pollinator highways are formed. And you don't even need a driver's license to use them. <laughs> and just like a road highway, these pathways make long commutes much easier, so the pollinators can access a bigger variety of food sources. And also, get to see different parts of the world. Oh boy. More pollinators mean more plants and crops. Without them helping to grow fruits and vegetables, we wouldn't survive. So pollinator highways are one type of highway we should all get behind. Already on it. Commencing though, do we want six lanes or eight? Oh. Hi there. If you're feeling down in the dumps, have we got an episode of Eco Engineering for you? Inputting coordinates for the dump. Where? It was a figure of speech. I was going to talk about beaches. <sighs> Oof, it sure does smell here. P.U. Since we're now at this garbage dump, let's shift our focus to landfills. Landfills store a lot of garbage that we throw away, <sighs> but they eventually fill up. So what do we do with the dumps that have no more room for garbage? Neutralize it? I can neutralize it! No, no, it's, uh, it's too big! Bye. Because old landfills contain a lot of unknown things that could be bad in our food, it's not the most ideal land to grow crops or build houses on. But one solution is to turn them into parks. Amazing to think this green space used to be a landfill. It took a lot of work to build it safely. Correct! This filled up landfill was sealed and capped with clean soil to provide a proper environment to grow a park. Hooray! Turning old garbage dumps into parks has been going on for a while now, and we're still monitoring the environmental impacts as the garbage decomposes. But in the meantime, we're making the best use of the space we can. Of course, in a perfect world, everything would be recycled and there would be no landfills. But the next best thing is to recycle the place where we buried all our garbage. Time for this engineer to lend a helping hand in carefully converting this dump into another park. Ugh, once I find my nose plugs, ugh. I did not prepare for this. Activating bad smell neutralizer. <sighs> Today, we're gonna look at another eco feature that can be added to a house, the rain garden. Correction, rain is created through the water cycle, not grown in a garden, inputting rainstorm coordinates. Yeesh! You had to go with the downpour? Engaging sound nullifier. Whew, that's better. You're right, rain comes from the water cycle. But rain gardens don't create rain, they collect it. In a lot of urban areas, stormwater runoff is an issue. Rain washing into sewers can cause flooding as well as carry pollution from our yards and roads into waterways. Activating propellers. One thing we can do to help is create rain gardens in our yards to hold and filter rainfall. By replacing parts of lawns with soil and plants that love water, like shrubs, wildflowers, and bulrushes, rainwater can collect in the yard and slowly be filtered and absorbed into the ground instead of flowing directly into our sewers. Research indicates that these rain gardens absorb roughly a third more stormwater runoff than grass lawns. What a way to level up a yard! Yes! Not to mention that they look pretty. 
and attract birds and beneficial insects like butterflies. Rain gardens added to database as a way to collect and reabsorb stormwater. Check. Phew, I think that's enough rain for today. My shell's starting to wrinkle. Initiating umbrella protocol. Uh, how about we just go back inside? Quickly, before someone sees this. Eco-engineers, we're gonna visit a hotel today. A bee hotel. <coughs> Error, bees do not have hotels. And if they did, they would be too small for us to stay in. Can I take your bag? Ugh. What room number? A bee hotel isn't an actual hotel, Rocky Pants. It's a structure that's built to be a home for bees that like to live alone. Not all bees live in hives. Correct. The most common type is the honeybee that live in colonies. But there are many other species of bees that live inside reeds and wooden burrows by themselves. I want to be alone. Right. And these solitary bees are also important pollinators which is why bee hotels like these have been built. With so much urban development happening, the natural habitats of some of these bees have been lost. So we've created bee hotels, bee lodges, and even bee bricks to help them out. Oh, yeah. Ah, so just make some holes in wood and bricks. Easy enough, initiating laser beam. Whoa, 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 not so fast. There's more to it than that. Sigh. If they're not built in place properly, they can attract unwanted insects and pests instead of bees. Hmm, valid point. We shall leave it to the experts. For now, let's just admire how functional these little structures are. Ah. Room service. Welcome back, eco-engineers. Today we're gonna check out some interesting urban gardens. Let's go! Uh, I believe the coordinates you sent may have been off. This is quite ungarden-like. Oh, we're at the right place, just the wrong height. You can get us up there, right, Rocky Pants? Of course. I will have us there in no time. Uh, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. They are playing my favorite song. And here we are. Whoa. What a spectacular view. Right? This is one of the many gardens built on the rooftops of high rises around this city. Rooftop gardens not only give people in tall buildings some much needed green space, but did you know they have a lot of other benefits too? Plants and gardens on rooftops keep buildings cooler in the summer. Oh yeah. Correct. Concrete absorbs heat from the sun much faster than plants. So rooftop gardens are a great source of heat protection. Rooftop gardens also help clean the air and filter out pollutants like smog and dust. I can smell the freshness already. I mean, I would if I had a nose. And provide food and habitats for birds and important pollinators like bees and butterflies. Some rooftops even have beehives and butterfly gardens to help them along and expand the pollinator highway. Amazing. Isn't it? Just goes to show that even in densest urban cities, there's still room for green space. So, which elevator do the bees and butterflies take to get up here? Uh, I think they just fly. What? On those little wings? I definitely need a rocket thruster upgrade. On today's Eco Engineer outing, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite eco products, bat boxes. A fantastic way to store sports equipment. Not those bats, Rocky Pants, the flying kind. Ah, a fellow creature of the sky. Woohoo! Bat boxes are like birdhouses, but for bats. Wide and flat. What a strange design. It's just how bats like them. They're built specifically for bats to roost and hang upside down in. I think all you planet protectors know how important bats are. Oh, yeah. They eat harmful insects, like mosquitoes. Mmm. Tasty. And they also pollinate flowers, disperse seeds, and create fertilizer for plants. Whew, close one. 
But unfortunately, bat populations were in huge decline in the early 2000s due to habitat loss. Affirmative. We did indeed lose a lot of woodland for buildings. And that's where bat boxes come in. By installing these around urban areas, planet protectors like you were able to help increase the bat population. While they don't replace natural roosting spots like caves and old trees, boxes placed in urbanized areas can help some bats find new homes. It's a bit of a fixer-upper, but the neighborhood is nice. They are definitely a lot cozier than they look. I can get used to this. Uh, maybe we leave these boxes to the bats. I think all the yolk is rushing to my head. Hey Planet Protectors! On today's Eco Engineer, we're going to look at an innovative way farms keep food waste out of landfills. By having potato eat more leftovers? <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad idea, but no, I'm talking about biodigesters. So you know that farms have a lot of organic waste from food scraps, animal droppings, and leftover materials from harvest, right? Really? Since composts require work and energy to maintain, if there's too much organic waste, a lot of it ends up in landfills. But there's a better solution! A biodigester! This appears to be a giant metal tank. It kind of is. This biodigester is an anaerobic one, which means microorganisms break down the organic waste without oxygen. Just like a metal stomach. Very similar. This produces methane and nutrient-rich water instead of carbon dioxide and solid fertilizer that we get with traditional composting. The methane can be harvested as biogas for cooking or to generate power, while the water can be reused to grow new plants. Turning organic waste into renewable energy and water for crops? What a brilliant contraption! Right? And because it requires a lot less maintenance, more organic waste can be processed and saved from landfills than compost. This seems like it could also work well beyond just farms. Yep. Some restaurants and hospitals are already using biodigesters to save on waste disposal and generate cleaner energy. Hmm, I wonder if I could get one installed. Uh, like at the bio barn? No, for me. I have always wanted to have a stomach. Think of all the different foods I could biodigest. <laughs> and we're going to move on now. Frittata and Rocket Pants here with another Eco Engineer episode. You know what we haven't talked about in a while? Solar power. Solar power? I have this covered. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Ah! Hot, 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 hot! I'm frying up here! The desert is where many solar farms are located due to the amount of direct sunlight available. Oh, you don't say. But we're talking about solar power in a, a more urban setting. Whew, much cooler. So you probably know that solar panels have been available for a while now. But since the 2020s, the technology has been improving. Solar cells have gotten smaller and more efficient. Pocket size. Not that I have any pockets. So instead of having giant panels installed on rooftops, we can actually replace the regular shingles and tiles with solar panel tiles. Not only does it look neater with the panels built into the tiles, but it also creates a bigger area to capture sunlight to power homes. For city buildings, some high-rises have been installing solar panels on their rooftops. But that usually means they can't have a rooftop garden. Which we have learned to be quite beneficial for people, animals, and even rocket power pumps. So instead of choosing between the green space and green energy, architects have been incorporating panels in different ways. Ooh, are those solar panels on the side of the building? Oh. Brilliant way to use sun-facing space. And it gets even better. There are now solar panels that are translucent, which means they let light through so they can replace the glass on buildings. As one of the fastest growing sources of renewable energy, it's super cool to see how we can now seamlessly incorporate solar power directly into our homes and offices. Fantastic way to make use of extra space. Hmm. Have you thought about installing some panels yourself? The bio barn already has solar panels. I mean the empty space on your back. There is a large amount of unused shell. Uh, we are not putting solar panels on my back. Think of all the energy we can directly generate to power me. Future chicken. We're 
back with another Eco Engineer outing. Since we love green energy, let's check out some wind power. Rocky Pants? Wind power coordinates set. Prepare to be blown away. Get it? <laughs> Breezy. So this is a traditional wind farm. Those wind turbines take the energy from these gusts and convert it into electricity. A fantastic way of generating power. By working together with local communities, we can build sustainable energy farms like these. Whoa! And while I'm sure you've seen these turbines before, do you know how gigantic they are up close? They're so big. Even transport ships can only carry a few blades at a time. Whoa, I will never complain about carrying you around again. These turbines have to be huge so they can capture as much wind as possible and keep turning even when the breeze is light. Also the reason why they are installed on high poles is open field. Right. But thanks to improvements in technology, wind turbines are now making their way into urban spaces. I am not sure that is a good idea. Uh, yeah. Home windmills are much smaller. And increased efficiency means a lot of them don't even need to be that high up anymore. There are even turbines that spin vertically, taking advantage of wind coming from all directions. My analysis shows vertical wind turbines are quieter and safer for wildlife, since their blades spin closer to the pole. Plus, they look pretty cool, almost like art installations. Hmm. Perfect for backyards, parks, and even building rooftops. Oh, yeah! Except for the ones that already have rooftop gardens, and rooftop beehives, and rooftop solar panels. It's definitely starting to get crowded up there. Good thing some new buildings have turbines built into their design. Built into their design? Do they stick out from the side? Gas! What a marvel of engineering! Isn't it? Just another example of how sustainable living can lead to innovative designs. I have just come up with a brilliant idea. Uh, I hope it doesn't involve installing anything on me. Uh, never mind. Hmm, I think it's time to head over to the playground. Ha, huh, yes. But by my calculations, our lunch break is not scheduled for another hour. Not to play, Rocky Pants, for an eco-engineer outing. Ha, huh, of course. <laughs> uh, I knew that. Uh, setting coordinates for business instead of pleasure. Check it out, folks. This is one of my favorite playgrounds. A splendid play space. I, too, have a bookmark in my favorites. We've played here lots, but have you ever stopped to take a look at how it's designed? It is colorful and easy to move around it. Yep, I love this playground because it was built to be accessible. Oh, yeah! The wide paths and ramps, in addition to stairs, let people with accessibility needs get to all the different parts of the playground. There's a lot of activities to engage different senses for children of all ages and abilities. Ugh while also having some play space for people who like to play alone. There is something for everyone. Yep, because playgrounds should be accessible and inclusive, so everyone can play together. Indeed. Taking care of the planet also means taking care of each other. And by making parks and play spaces easier to access, more people get to connect with nature. Now that is my type of design. We're lucky that more and more playgrounds are being built this way. A lot of older ones weren't. Shall we find some of these old playgrounds and rebuild them to be more accessible? Metal Saw and Plasma Welder, ready to go! Uh, maybe we leave that to the city builders. Hello. <sighs> All work and no play makes Rocket Pants a dull bot. Ooh, is that a titanium slide? I should. Test drive it for safety checks, of course. Ah! Whee! 